very rich program. And uh, I have a, an announcement to make at the beginning and then we'll go right to the first part of our program. So hello everybody, welcome to our February 6, 2023 retiree chapter meeting. We just met two weeks ago, so uh, um, we had a little space and um, it's good to see you all again. I um, would like to make an announcement before we introduce the program and start the speakers. And that is about a very important event that's going to take place on February 27th. Many of you may know about that already. If you've gotten uh, your messages from the PSE office, you've gotten our blast. And that is a early morning rally, which some people think is just perfect for seniors like us, because we get up early, some of us maybe, but we certainly can get up early and get ourselves to 42nd Street for a rally outside of the Board of Trustees. And the reason for this is that the day after on the 28th, the collective bargaining agreement expires and our uh, leaders and delegate assembly and chapter chairs are raring to go and to uh, insist that management come to the table right away. And that is not always an easy, that's never an easy job to get management to the table. So uh, this, this, ra this rally uh, is to bring as many members of the PSC out to support what's a very interesting and progressive wide ranging, wide -ranging bargaining agenda that the delegate assembly just passed overwhelmingly last Thursday. So it's time for management to come to the table once we get to March 1st. And um, we know that now that we're retired, basically the contract does not really affect us. There are a couple things in there for uh, re retirees, but that doesn't matter because we're all PSC members. We all support each other and we all know how important it is to especially support our in-service colleagues now because they have stepped up to the plate really well to support us and defend our fight for uh, traditional Medicare and senior care. James was here two weeks ago, you heard him speak. Uh, he's really been supportive. Our members have called, they've been to uh, City Hall, they've written letters. And so now it's um, time for us to support them. If you get to 42nd Street, 205 East 42nd Street, like 7.30, a little earlier, you'll get a nice red PSC t-shirt. You'll get some nice PSC swag and uh, you will make everybody else very happy to see you because uh, we're, everyone's always happy to see the retirees. So Ava Farkas, who's in yellow, our staff person, is she staffing the meeting? She's going to put a link in the chat that you can use to sign up directly to her uh, saying that you'll be there on the 27th and maybe you'll also be available to do some phone banking to get other people out. We hope to get, if we can get 25 retirees out there, I would consider that a success. So um, hopefully we could double that, but uh, you know, let's see. So um, with that said, uh, I'm gonna, I wanna thank Yuda Bradford at the beginning, so I don't forget, she's one of our EC members and she's going to be taking notes today and uh, let's get started. So as uh, PSC members, we know that in a broad sense, we fight for the common good. And this includes, of course, our work on healthcare, our work on the social safety net. And today's topic, controlling climate change, options for success, also, as I'm sure we all know, 
addresses healthcare and safety uh, issues. And so we're looking for ways to advocate to move toward a more livable planet for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. And we have two really distinguished speakers to talk to us today about that. The first speaker will be Ann Reynolds, who is the executive director of the Alliance for Clear Energy of New York. She's also a member of the New York State Climate Action Council, which is tasked with preparing recommendations to meet the state's energy and climate goals. She will speak for 30 minutes, and then we will hear from our second speaker, Len Rodberg, Professor Emeritus and longtime chair of the Urban Studies Department at Queens College and a well-known member of our chapter. Len is co-director of Community Studies of New York and an activist on several main issues, including climate change. He will also speak for 30 minutes, and then we'll take a Q&A. And it would be best if you Rather than putting your questions in the chat, if you waited and raised your hand, and then we could hear from everybody, because whatever your question is, I'm sure others will be interested in. And then, of course, we will go to the second part of our program, which, as usual, be, will be on health care. Um, and Dean Hubbard, our executive director, will join us. So with that, I'd like to invite Ann Reynolds uh, to speak. And the understanding, Ann, is that we'll tell you privately in the chat when you're close to five minutes, right? Okay. okay. Thank you, Ann. The other Ann with an E. I love it. <laughs> yep. We love those Anns with an E. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak to you folks today. Just a little background on who I am and the organization I work for, um, just so you can know, you know, my um, point of view and where my biases might lie. Um, I am the executive director, as was mentioned, of a group called the Alliance for Clean Energy New York. We've been around for 16 years, and it was started by some New York State environmental groups in partnership with some wind energy companies, thinking, okay, we have common ground here. Let's uh, create an organization to advocate for renewable energy. And over the course of years, we've grown to include uh, solar power as well, and then offshore wind as well, energy storage. We have companies that do transmission. We have companies that do energy efficiency and building electrification. Uh, we have two companies that manufacture electric vehicles. We have a handful of companies that do electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We have hydroelectric, um, companies as members, I think one fuel cell member. So um, sort of a, a diverse group of companies that are involved in the clean energy sector in New York State. But we still maintain our connection with the environmental group. So our board of directors is made up of half for-profit companies and half nonprofit organizations working together to try to uh, promote clean energy and the clean energy transition in New York State, which I, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> you can see if you agree at the end of this talk is that transition is underway already. So um, NYSERDA is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. It's the state agency that's most involved, but not exclusively. Um, it's not, there's other agencies involved as well, but most involved in trying to get renewable energy built in New York. Um, and that work had been happening for over a decade. Um, and then in 2019, the climate law was passed and that's the Climate Leadership and Community Pr Protection Act. So we enthusiastically supported that. Um, it's a very ambitious law and New York is really in the forefront of, of fighting climate change. You know, I've been at this for a while and I feel like we're finally on the cusp of getting a lot of renewable energy built and deployed. Um, and seeing some results of all our work, but of course that remains to be seen and things always take longer than you think. Um, but right after the law passed, uh, the Climate Action Council was formed, it has 22 members. I was appointed to that by the New York State Senate, the, the uh, majority um, party in the Senate. And so for you know nearly three years, we met every month and discussed what the plan should be to meet what's some really ambitious targets. So my plan for you today was to give you a 
flyby, <laughs> a flyby review of what the plan says because it's a it's a uh, some 450 pages long. It's very detailed, um, but I figure I can give you a flavor of what the plan says and then uh, maybe stimulate some other questions or interests uh, for those of you that might be further interested. So you should see on your screen something that says New York's climate scoping plan overview. Do folks, can you give me a thumbs up if you see that? Okay, good. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So the plan was uh, finalized just in December. So this is hot off the presses. Um, and I'm going to run through, you know, some of the things that it says in there. It has an executive summary, as you might imagine, that summarizes um, both what the plan recommends and what the next steps would be. Um, and it also talks about why we are developing this plan. I mean, the most obvious answer is because the legislature passed a law that told us we had to, uh, but we also talk about the impacts of climate change, which, of course, the world is already uh, beginning to feel and recognize. So here's a little bit about a context of this. This um, I apologize, this slot, the graph on the left is a little hard to read, but I'll tell you the colors. So these are the sources of greenhouse gas emissions in New York State. And so the uh, dark blue in the bottom right-hand corner is transportation of all types. The upper right-hand corner, the gold color is buildings. So think uh, the heating in your, in your home and your office building and your universities, as well as your water heating and then your other, other things that you might use like clothes dryers or, or cooking. Um, the bottom left, uh, Kelly Green is electricity generation. Um, and then above that you have waste, which includes landfills where all our garbage goes and then the other sources of waste management. And then those small um, wedges here of the pie cover a variety of topics, including refrigerants, animal feeding, other industry, other agri uh, agriculture, and then fugitive emissions. So you can see from this, if you think climate emissions are a problem, that the sources of our problem are buildings and transportation, electricity as well, but to a lesser degree. That's in part because we have cleaned up New York's electricity generating fleet quite a bit in the last 40 years. Um, you see there it's just natural gas. There's no more operating coal plants in New York State. Um, and, uh, but electricity is very important because if we reduce emissions from buildings and transportation, at least according to this plan, the way we're going to do that is by electrifying those. So having electric cars, electric buses, electric trucks, electric space heating, electric water heating. And so that demand for electricity is going to increase. And so we need to have our electric grid be, um, be powered by zero emission technologies, which includes renewable energy and can also include nuclear. And we also need to make more electricity to meet that growing need. So on the right-hand side, you see a chart that's just about electricity. And this is a projected, this is not the way it is now. This is the analysis that was done for the plan and it projected out for 2040. Um, so we don't know for sure that it's gonna come out with exactly these, um, these scale of each type of technology, but this was done with some, with some modeling based on the cost of each and this is what was expected. So if we, if, big if, if we meet our goals, um, this is what the electricity sector would look like in 2040. So it would be 62% intermittent renewables, that's wind and solar. Um, the uh, wind one there, land-based wind is the darker green. There's an offshore, offshore wind, and then the yellow colors are solar. And it, you know, has a difference. It's the same technology, but whether it's behind the meter, think of that as rooftop solar or community size solar and grid connected, which would be a large solar farm um, that would operate like a power plant and be selling its power into the wholesale market. And then the blue section is baseload resources. So those are uh, nuclear and hydroelectric. Um, and then the purple is energy storage. So right now that's mostly lithium ion batteries, but we're hoping there'll be some new technologies for long duration storage. And then there's this other category that's gray and in hash marks called 
DEFRs, Dispatchable Emissions Free Resources. And that is a long-winded way of saying, we don't know what that's going to be. But it recognizes that at a certain point, you can't keep building wind and solar um, and expect to get all the way there with our electricity needs because there just is going to be some times when the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, you've used up all your energy storage and you still have some power demand. So it does have to be emissions free under our law. Uh, and it does have to be dispatchable, something we can turn on and off, but what exactly it will be is sort of a, 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 de a debate to be had still in New York, as well as a technology challenge and market challenge. Um, but I spent more time on these two pie charts than I'm gonna spend on any of the other slides because it's the context in which this plan was developed. First off on the left, where are the emissions coming from? And then on the right, where could we possibly get our electricity from? So the, um, the climate law has a lot of specific requirements in it that are listed here. Some specific emissions reductions that are economy-wide. So across all of the sources in New York, our goal was to try to reduce them by 85% by 2050 in this planning exercise. But as I mentioned, there's also a requirement to have 100% zero emission electricity, a certain amount of renewable energy by 2030, certain amounts of offshore wind and energy storage and solar, and a, a big focus on energy efficiency as well. Then it created a 22 member council. Most of those folks were the heads of various state agencies like NYSERDA, Public Service Commission, Department of Environmental Conservation, et cetera. Some of those folks were appointed like me and they were appointed by either the Senate, the assembly or the governor. It also had a climate justice working group that was laid out in the law, which was a separate group that we interacted with quite a bit um, and some other groups too that will come up as I'm buzzing through this. Um, so chapter three is more of this contextual information, the fact that um, there's a lot of things that New York has got done already, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, but this top one's kind of interesting um, because time and time again in polls and more recently in, in these votes, New Yorkers really support climate action, um, renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, and environmental protection. Uh, so so um, between the passage of the law and that uh, voice of support, I, I felt that the council had a, a strong mandate to go forth and, and come up with a plan to meet these ambitious goals. Here's another chart about current emissions. I won't go through the, that again. Um, and um, chapter five, sets out the vision. What does the world have to look like in 2030 and 2040 and 2050 to meet the requirements of, of the law? It's also really important to know, and this came up recently, I testified to the Senate on this plan. They had a hearing on it two weeks ago. This is a plan. This is not a regulation or a law. Each part of the plan has to be enacted by the state. Some parts of it have to go back to the legislature and have bills be passed. Other parts of it, the state can go ahead and do without the legislature, but they still need a public pro process and a rulemaking process. So it's just a guide to let us know, you know, what we need to do to meet these targets. But, you know, it's a very important guide because what we need to do is pretty ambitious. Um, chapter five also talks about the process. We had a ton of meetings, lots of public hearings, lots of opportunities for, for, um, for public input, thousands, something like 27,000 public comments um, that this team had to go through. Um, I mentioned that there's this climate justice working group. Um, they were assigned the very difficult task of saying, what is a disadvantaged community in New York State? because the law says that when we implement this plan, whatever investments the state makes, 35% of the benefits have to accrue in disadvantaged communities, which is an excellent goal and really nation leading. Uh, but it does raise the sticky question of what is a disadvantaged communities and the climate justice working group, that was their main assignment and they have proposed a definition and that hasn't actually been final, completely finalized yet. Um, 
It also says that there's a priority of reducing emissions of other pollutants in disadvantaged communities and doing some air community monitoring in disadvantaged communities. There's a separate report that I won't go into that the law required called the Barriers and Opportunities Report, again, focused on climate justice. There was um, some further direction that the plan has to address past practices and historically marginalized and overburdened communities, part of the climate justice um, components of the plan. You could have a whole discussion just on the, those parts of it. There's also a section on just transition. So an, an assertion in the law that we should be helping those communities where power plants are gonna shut down and they might be major taxpayers in the community, they might be employers in the community and those folks should be retrained and reemployed. Um, and we also don't want, we want to minimize what they call carbon leakage and anti-competitiveness, which is a way of saying if we ratchet down um, so abruptly and across the board on emissions to the point where some employers or factories just move to Canada or move to Mexico or move to Pennsylvania and continue to emit carbon dioxide, then we haven't really made much progress or any in fighting climate change. And so we had to find a way to avoid that sort of outcome. Chapter eight covers public health. Um, lots of details there. Chapter nine, for those of you that are the types that really like to look at the numbers and the modeling, you might wanna skip right to chapter nine. This is where um, they did what we refer to as the integration analysis. Um, that chart that I pointed out at the beginning that uh, predicted what the sources of electricity would be in 2030 and 2040 was a result of this integration analysis. But I will pause here to say that one thing that the group did is uh, form, and the law told us to, we didn't think of this ourselves, uh, formed a whole bunch of technical advisory panels. So there would be one on electricity, one on buildings, one on waste, one on uh, industrial sources. And those folks came back after nearly a year, maybe 10 months with a whole list of recommendations. Here's things you can do to reduce the pollution that causes global warming from those different sectors. The Climate Action Council, the group that I was part of, did not go through and say, we like this one, we don't like this, we like this one and whittle that list down. All of those ideas went into the, the melting pot for the integration analysis. And the modeling, I think it was E3 was the name of the company that did that. The modeling came back and said, if you do all of those things that were recommended, you still don't meet the goals on time. And, and that's sort of a, I tell this part of the story because it's an indication of how ambitious these goals are. And so they had to go back and tweak some things and move some dates forwards and get more aggressive on some things in order for us to meet the goals on time. Um, key findings of the analysis is that you have to have action in all of those sectors. You can't say, well, the biggest problem is buildings and as long as we just focus on buildings, we'll get to the goals because you will not. It has to be across the board. You have to have energy efficiency. You have to have electrification. We need to transition to some low global warming potential refrigerants. So there's gonna be some changes made there. Consumer and community decision-making is key, which means what people buy, what kind of car they buy, how they insulate their house, how they replace their heating is really going to be the key to if New York State's going to meet these goals. And that will substantially need to reduce what's called VMT or vehicle miles traveled which is another way of saying, even if we require all new vehicles to be electric, which is gonna to be tough, and we are going to do that, um, so many vehicles, including off-road vehicles, stay in operation for decades. Um, and we won't meet the, the targets in the law under that scenario. So we also have to try to get more people taking public transit, um, electric buses, subways, et cetera, in order to meet the goals on time. Um, other key findings. So wind, water, and sunlight, solar power, wind power, and hydroelectric power will power most of the electric sector and thereby most of New York's economy in 2050. The plan does include maintaining the upstate nuclear energy plants as well. Um, even with all that, we probably are going to need some low carbon fuels, including hydrogen or bioenergy to tackle some of those hard to electrify uses or sectors. 
Um, we need to make sure we're maximizing our sequestration of carbon by having healthy forests um, and lots of forestry growth that can sequester those emissions. Um, we have a big issue with methane emissions from landfills and agriculture, and we're gonna need to re reduce those if we wanna meet the goals. We're gonna need a lot of research development demonstration in order to get there. And then if all of our dreams come true and we're successful in reducing emissions in all these, way, all these ways, the last three remaining sources of emissions in 2050 will be, be landfills, aviation, and animal feeding if we, if we achieve that. Um, chapter 10 um, is the benefit cost analysis. And um, they basically come down to, this is sort of after a long chapter, the bottom line, the benefit of inaction exceeds the cost of action by about 115 billion. There's a range in net benefits um, from 115 to 130 billion. Um, the, it costs, it's gonna cost some money, it's definitely costs some money, but the net direct costs happen to be small relative to the size of the entire New York economy. And they also, so half, not halfway, but you know, 80% of the way through this process, the federal climate legislation passed known as the Inflation Reduction Act. So they did go do a sensitivity analysis and said, okay, if New York maximizes our benefit from this new federal program, will it help us meet our goals cheaper? And um, the analysis came back that it could potentially sell, save New York 70 billion by virtue of all the different parts of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, they did a cost sensitivity analysis. Of course, it really depends on a lot of, a lot of different factors how the economy is growing or shrinking, what the price of natural gas is, um, if the costs of electric vehicles come down or go up. Um, and then there's also health effects um, in terms of avoided uh, hospital bills and avoided loss of life from the reduction of co-pollutants because nearly everything you do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions also reduces other pollutants, oxides of nitrogen, uh, small particulate matter, et cetera. Okay, now I have, uh, according to my clock here, <laughs> nine minutes more. So I'm going to very quickly go through these. I was not planning on going through them in detail, but I did wanna give you a flavor of how the plan is set up. So I've got some slides here. Um, chapter 11 is on transportation. And for each chapter, it talks about what New York is doing now and what the current situation is. Um, and then it recommends key strategies for that sector and groups them together. So for transportation, one is to adopt ZEVs is zero emission vehicles. So electric cars, for example, um, and then adoption of zero emission trucks and buses. Uh, then there's also recommendations related to public transportation and mobility. We have to try to get folks out of their cars and into public transit. There's a lot of uh, recommendations about smart growth and mo mobility oriented development. Um, probably many of you don't listen to the annual state of the state speech that the governor makes, but uh, it is part of my job. And this year, one of the main focuses on the speech was housing. And she really um, highlighted how that all that new housing that New York needs to build needs to be transit linked, um, which in New York City, of course, it inevitably would be, but in other parts of the state, state, not necessarily. If we can get all that new housing to be linked to transit, get people out of their cars, it will help us meet our climate goals. Um, and then there's also some recommendations about financing and different strategies to try to get um, investment in clean transportation. So that was the transportation chapter. Chapter 12 is buildings. So once again, it has this uh, vision and you, if you read even one of these chapters, you'll see it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to get, to get to these goals and to get them on time. Um, so in the case of buildings, we need to scale up um, energy efficient building, what's called envelope upgrades. So that means a, a, a upgrade of your uh, insulation in your home, the energy efficiency of your home, your apartment, your condo, uh, your co-op, uh, your office building. Um, there's numbers in there of how quickly we have to renovate all the buildings in New York, and it, it's it's very aggressive. Um, and in order to meet the requirement 2050, um, 
you'd have to have 85% of buildings energy efficient by 2050. So that's gonna require some updates to the building codes and building standards. There's some recommendations about that. This, some of these made it into the governor's proposed budget for this year. Financial incentives so that people can decarbonize their buildings. It's not the type of thing that everyone will pay for themselves uh, voluntarily without some financial incentives, even if you end up saving money. Um, there's other recommendations for buildings about financing again, um, and then some awareness, some public awareness, some innovation, some research, um, and some, some transition from hydrofluorocarbons. So electricity um, is chapter 13. Again, the vision is that by 70, that by 2030, 70% of the electricity will be coming from renewable energy sources. And by 2040, that would be 100% um, emissions free is what, the, is what the law requires. But we know that will be a challenge. We need to accelerate the construction of wind and solar projects. We need to facilitate distributed energy sources, think like rooftop solar, community solar. We need to invest in the transmission system to make sure the transmission system is, is ready to accept all those new renewables. Um, we need to support, we need communities to be welcoming of this renewable energy, which is a big part of my job. I can tell you they are not always welcoming. Um, we need to deploy energy storage, so that's batteries. Um, we need to invest in transmission, as I mentioned, improve reliability planning and market solutions, and advance some demand-side solutions. Demand-side solutions means um, managing when electricity is demanded. So if everyone gets an electric car and everyone charges their electric car at the same hour every day, that will be an incredibly incredible burden on the um, electric grid. If it's managed in a different way and everyone charges their car overnight, that problem, that will be better. So there can be a big change in what the grid needs based on if you um, have some of these demand side solutions. Um, and we definitely need new technologies. This is the thing I mentioned in the beginning. Um, we need to have that 10% of electricity use in 2040 and 2050 will have to be something that's clean, zero emissions and dispatchable. So that could be alternative fuels, um, green hydrogen. It could be uh, additional long duration storage. It could be some emerging nuclear technologies um, that could be dispatchable. We don't exactly know what it's gonna be. We know we have the technology to get to 90% emissions free, for example. Uh, but like anything in life, it's that last percentage that's the hardest to achieve. And that's certainly gonna be true for the electric grid as well. Chapter 14 is on industrial sources of, of greenhouse gas emissions, has a lot of recommendations for that. Chapter 15 is on agriculture. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to tackle emissions from the agriculture sector a different way than you would tackle emissions from transportation because we also, of course, are depending on these same farms for our food and our uh, and jobs and the upstate economy. So, and they're uh, not large corporations, they're individuals still in New York State. So we need to have maybe more incentives on the agriculture side and less mandates. Um, chapter 16 is waste. Uh, turns out uh, waste is a big source of greenhouse gas emissions, um, especially because this law required that New York calculate the emissions using a different methodology based on 20 year global warming potential instead of 100 year global warming potential, which is the way it's done mostly everywhere else. And that ex um, accentuates the contributions of the waste sector to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, let's see. Seven, chapter 17 is what they called economy wide strategies, which comes right down to it is basically how do we ensure we meet these requirements of the law and how do we pay for them? Is there some sort of price signal we can integrate into the economy to reduce emissions? And that's what chapter 17 is about. We put forward a different, some options like a carbon tax would be one of the options. In the end, the plan recommends a different approach called a cap and invest where you would cap all the emissions across the economy you would uh, require 
folks who are entities that emit under that cap to purchase allowances at the wholesale level. And you would auction those allowances, generate revenue, and reinvest that revenue into the type of things that will let us meet the goals. And this recommendation was actually um, included in the governor's uh, state of the state speech this year as well. It has an entire chapter on um, phasing out the gas system um, and how New York could transition away from gas. Again, this could be a whole three hours of conversation right here, uh, but this was one of the controversial ones, as you might imagine. It has a chapter on land use and local government, number 19. And then it has a section on adaptation and resilience, not how we can avoid emissions that cause global warming, but how we can get ready for it and make ourselves stronger. Um, there's a lot about partnerships and reporting in chapter 22. And there's a whole bunch of appendices for anyone who wants to know even more. Um, I had just one graph from the appendices that I'm gonna show, and this is my last slide, just to give you a flavor of the type of information that's in the appendices if you're a technical person and really wants to dive in deeper. Um, this has some projections of the installed capacity uh, under one of the scenarios, I should have said, there's there's three different scenarios that they ana analyzed, as well as a lot of uh, sensitivity analyses. Um, what would be the installed capacity in, again, this is the electricity sector. And then on the other side, what would be the generation profile of that uh, electricity sector um, in the year? So just very simply, I'll show you, or just point out on the slide on the right, for example, it shows that our electricity demand between 2020 and 25 is actually going down because of all the efficiency measures that are recommended in the plan. Then it starts to go up in 2030. But between 2030 and 2050, there's a, there's a pretty clear and um, steep increase in electricity demand under this plan. That's because if we're successful, people would be switching to electric vehicles and electric heating in their homes and buildings. And that's what's causing the electricity demand to rise. And so in order to meet that need, we have to um, put in place more generating technologies to create more electricity. So that was my last slide. I think that brings me to 30 minutes. It's a whirlwind tour through the climate action scoping plan and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ann. That's quite a, a project. Um, okay, I, I see a couple of hands up, but um, we're going to take questions after Len speaks, if that's okay. Uh, do you have, uh, an, uh, Ava, do you have a question? I did, but I can hold it till after. Anna. Is it a question about the content or a question? Yeah, about, about, oh, about the content. Okay, no, no. Okay, we'll take that after. William, same. Let's wait till after we hear from Len. Uh, William Laziza, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Len is going to talk about something interesting as well. Go ahead, Len. Okay, can, can people see this, my opening slide? Yes. Um, because um, you can see the approach I'm taking, the plan that uh, Anne presented depends upon electricity. Every, every single sector she described dep depends on the, the growth and operation of the electric society. And the plan is presented, as I say here, it won't work, but we can develop one that will work. And we better have do that if we want, are serious and want to really make progress on climate change. Now, um, my, this is going to be very swift. Uh, it, uh, the presentation, but I have it in four parts. First, very briefly, why the 2020s that we're in now are not the 1970s, why the state's energy plan won't work. Number three, why a plan with nuclear power will work. And finally, is nuclear power safe to use? Because I suspect that many of the people in this Zoom room uh, grew up in a time when nuclear was to, to be avoided, including me. So this is a transition. I went through a learning process and I'm trying to help other people do the same. So in the 1970s, let me remind you, we had an energy crisis. Uh, and at the same time, we were also talking and worried about nuclear fallout. We were in a, 
in uh, uh, dealing with the, uh, the nuclear test ban treaty that I was involved in. Um, and solar energy was seen at the time of the oil embargo as one way to reduce our exposure to the rising price of oil. And so the, the idea was we would, we would use solar panels to, to provide some of our energy, but not all of it at night when the sun isn't shining, we'd have to rely on the grid. We might sell power back to the grid uh, during the day when if we produced more than we were using in our houses. That was the model in the 1970s. It seemed all very attractive. Uh, I wrote a lot about it. A lot of people came to believe in it. Uh, but the situation today is very different because what we're talking about today and what Ann was talking about is powering the whole society on renewable energy, on basically on solar and wind. So it's a very, very different concept from one in which you cut off, cut, try to supplement a bit uh, the power that you're using. Um, so this is a solar farm. Uh, I don't know where this one is, not New York, because New York, I'll show you in a minute, the only one that actually exists at this point. Um, but here's, here's the scoping plan that Anna's describing. And she read us this quote, and I'm gonna repeat it. The, the plan says that wind, which is wind power, water power, the hydropower that go, flows up, up along the St. Lawrence River and the Niagara River uh, and sunlight, solar energy will power most of New York's economy in 2050. Now, I should emphasize there that nuclear power is excluded. I attended every public meeting of the Climate Action Council, it was about at least a year and a half. Nuclear power was never discussed. It was like the N word. Uh, until the last session before they approved the final plan. And then NYSERDA came in with a small uh, proposal for a proposal for a small amount of nuclear power, in spite of the fact that it supplies more than 20% of our electricity today. And uh, un until two years ago, it was supplying a third of all of our electricity. So what does the plan provide? It provides, as Ann said, a lot of solar energy. Today, we have about 4,000 megawatts. It's to grow to 55,000. If you put it in terms of solar panels, it's over 100 million solar panels. That's, a, so that's the one solar farm. That's a, that is a grid-connected field of solar panels. It exists out on Long Island. It was set up by Brookhaven National Laboratory. It's 32 megawatts. Um, we'd need 1,700 of them by 2050, according to this, the plan that the Climate Action Council approved. Uh, we need land-based wind, another 9,000 megawatts of large, very large, there's a picture that shows you how large the uh, wind, wind turbines are there against the Eiffel Tower. Um, this, is the, this is a map of the applications that are now being considered by, that have been submitted to the group, the organization is called NISO, which operates our grid in New York State. And it blankets the state because wherever there's open land, people, entrepreneurs want to install solar panels and put up wind turbines. Um, there has not been any environmental analysis of what the impact would be on this, of this. Then there's very, very large offshore wind. This was a favorite of, uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor, when the Climate Action Council was created. Um, we don't have any. There are five wind turbines off of Rhode Island, off of Block Island, but we don't have any yet. But the plan is to have 17,000 megawatts, 1,700 of these, very, very large, 10 megawatts per, per turbine uh, by, 20, by 2050. Uh, and finally, we have, a lot of, have to have a lot of storage. And mentioned that. Uh, because there's times when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And you need, if the sun goes down just as the peak in electric usage goes up as we people co come home from work and, you know, turn on their stoves and their, and their clothes washers and their lights and their computers and everything. So you need, you need large numbers of batteries. Uh, in spite of that, it's not enough. In spite of all that construction, that's not enough. This is a quote from the executive summary of the scoping plan. And it says, 
that the 2040 goal of emission-free electricity requires between 15 gigawatts, that's a thousand megawatts, and 45 gigawatts of electricity from zero emission dispatchable resources. And just discuss that, and I'll discuss that more in a few minutes. In order to meet demand and maintain reliability, this requires something that's dispatchable, which means it responds to demand. As demand changes, the technology responds to demand. Solar and wind don't respond to demand. They respond to what's happening in the weather at the moment. Now, in, in spite of the size of that, I, I have a footnote, which I wanna emphasize here. Today, we have 26 gigawatts of fossil fuel capacity. So while the contribution in the model that Ann described that NYSERDA is, this, is projecting, while the output of this zero emission dispatchable source um, uh, is not used very much, it's actually only used 2% in NYSERDA, of the time in NYSERDA's models, it has to be huge. It's not something just small. It's not the less, it's not as 10%. It's, its contribution is less than 10%, but it is as large as current fossil fuel capacity because it occur, it's needed. I'm going to explain this in a second. It's needed when the sun and wind aren't providing anything. So it has to take up the, load, the full load when the sun and wind aren't. Um, so uh, first of all, what does this mean for New York? Well, if New York, is, is this model is going to depend on that offshore wind. It happens to be in the, in, the, in the path of the storms that come up every year from the Caribbean, and they're getting more intense every year. Any time a storm comes north, the wind turbines have to shut down in order to protect their fans. If they try to, to run while the storm is coming through, even if it's not a, a, not a category five hurricane, they, uh, they, sh they shut down and New York needs to have some kind of power or the lights will go out in all of downstate New York, in fact, because downstate will be depending on that offshore wind. This is what happened in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria came through and it wiped out the turbine. So the blackout might last for years while the turbines are replaced. Clearly, it's not something we can depend on. Um, the larger, larger description of this is a German word. They, Germany, as you may, may recall, uh, has been leading the world in converting to solar and wind. And they had to invent a word for what they experienced. And the word is Dunkelflauter, which means dark doldrum or a, a period. It can last days or weeks and it's widespread of a broad overcast with lulls in the wind. And this is a picture, this comes from a presentation by NISO, the people who operate our grid. And what it shows, the green is wind, the yellow is solar, and the red is batteries. And this is the output of each of them. And you see there are periods, in the, particularly in the winter, four or five, six days, when none of those can provide what is needed to meet the load. The load varies you know, through the day. That's what the variation you see there at the top. And the gray is has to be filled in by this dispatchable source, uh, which uh, is referred to. This is the second new term I want to introduce, which is defer, which uh, and again referred to. It's a dispatchable emission-free resource. As Anne said, this the Climate Action Council didn't say what it was. It didn't even give any that any con consideration that I heard in the meetings to it. But it is not a minor thing. It is very, very large, as I just pointed out to you. So NYSERDA suggests using hydrogen, that is burning hydrogen in power plants to provide the electricity we need when the sun and wind aren't capable of providing what we need. Um, and here are the facts. None, there's no hydrogen produced in New York today. The only hydrogen we produce now is it produced by oil companies uh, as, a, as a way of getting more oil out of the ground by using hydrogen uh, as a vehicle for that. Um, in order to produce the hydrogen in a clean way, uh, we would need additional solar and wind. And I certainly has calculated what it is. It's about a 20% increase, assuming half of the hydrogen come, is produced in state and the half is imported from someplace else. 
but hydrogen is, so we don't at the moment have any way of producing it in New York. It's difficult to transport. It can't be put through the natural gas pipelines because it, it's such a small molecule, it leaks through. It's difficult to store once you get it to the power plants to, to be waiting for the emergency when you have to provide power uh, because same reason. And finally, we don't have any power plants that can run it. On the other hand, nuclear power already exists in this state. It is very reliable. And the new plants that are being developed by, a, by an emerging industry of, of uh, small modular reactors will be dispatchable. Uh, even though current reactors are not run in that way, they run flat out. So uh, let me just point out before I give you more on, the, on nuclear that it is compared to the renewables, a blessing for the environment. It uses very little land compared to solar and wind uh, and very low materials. And plants, as you'll see in a minute, are very small uh, compared to the vast amounts of materials, not only silicon, but lithium for the batteries that uh, is required by uh, solar and wind. Uh, so here's, here's, the, here's three of the four nuclear plants in New York City, New York State, these are operating their own Lake Ontario. Um, the one has a cooling tower, which is what we usually somehow associate with nuclear power, but you don't need that because you, you need cooling water and that's why it's on, these are on the, uh, on the lake. Newer plants, by the way, don't need cooling water. They can be placed any place. Uh, so these are the three plants that are operating. The people in the communities around them love them. You can see that they're clean, they're small, they produce cheap power. Uh, uh, what's not to like? Well, the people in Westchester County didn't like this plant. This is Indian Point, two reactors. Uh, it supplied a quarter of New York City's and the downstate electricity. And it's now shut down because Andrew Cuomo made a deal to shut it down and in, to replace it, to build two gas plants in the, in, uh, the Mid, Mid Hudson Valley region. Um, but I want to give you an idea of the scale of nuclear power. One of those reactors, either one of those reactors, produce more electricity than all the solar and wind that currently exists in New York State. <coughs> nuclear energy is, you know, sort of per gram, a million times more powerful than um, uh, uh, burning of things. So, uh, than or, ordinary uh, ordinary experience in daily life. So this this is a, a plant. Uh, here's the consequence of shutting down that plant. This shows from 2019 to 2022. The green is the new decline in nuclear output because we closed the biggest nuclear plant we had, the three upstaters, somewhat smaller than Indian Point. What went up was fossil fuels. Cuomo claimed that it'll be replaced by renewables, but you can see the renewables down there, the wind and solar are still small and they don't respond to demand. The fossil fuel burning, the gas burning responded and there's more imports now from other states uh, and from Canada than uh, before. So we actually are, are emitting more carbon dioxide today than we ever, than we have in the last 10 years. So here's, here's a simple model of what we could do instead of what we're doing. We could build 20 Indian Point plants. They could, would alone power New York State with nothing else added. No wind, no solar, nothing offshore, no offshore wind. Uh, it's not necessarily what I'm recommending because it's an old style plant, but I, just to give you an idea of what nuclear plants can do, this could provide not only all the electricity we use today, but all the electricity we need, which is about twice as much as today, if we were to electrify everything as Anne described. What I would, th this is more like the model that we would, we would want to build. This is a reactor called, a design called the Natrium. It's built, being built by a firm called TerraPower, which Bill Gates is the, in which he's the principal investor. And it's dispatchable. That is, its output can be, uh, its electric output can be varied depending on how much demand there is for electricity. Basically, the reactors run, which you can see in the lower lower left, uh, runs full time. But the heat, what a reactor does, it produces heat. 
and the heat is stored in those tanks. And then the, the heat is released into the form of steam to burn the, to run the turbine when the, when the electricity is needed. Otherwise it's just stored there or it might be used for other, for other purposes. Like if you had a factory nearby, it could use the heat for industrial purposes. So, so let me get to now my fourth part of my talk. What about, what about the problems with nuclear? First, what about the waste? Well, this is a picture, an aerial photo of the Indian Point plant. And in the lower left, you can see the waste, 46 years of waste. The plant ran for 46 years before it was shut down. Uh, by the way, it set a world record for longevity. One of the reactors, the last one to shut down, ran for two years without stopping before it was shut down. Those are, that's the waste down there. It's, it, there, there are concrete casks. The fuel rods are inside. Uh, they're surrounded by a chain link fence. Uh, and nobody's ever been hurt by any nuclear waste, including this nuclear waste. What are you gonna do with it? Well, you can leave it there for a while and it'll just cool off. But you can also do this. You can store it a mile underground by just using the well drilling uh, technology that the fracking folks have developed. Uh, this has already been, been uh, developed and tested and uh, the federal government is subsidizing the further research on it. You can put the fuel rods down there. If you leave them there, they'll be there for a million years and they'll never bother anybody, but you can actually retrieve them later because there's a lot of unused uranium in there and you could use the uranium to power uh, new modern breeder reactors. Uh, but it certainly gets rid of the waste and it doesn't require building big depositories that people will object to. Um, and I want to note that solar and wind also produce waste. This is, you know, here's uh, solar panels and uh, uh, wind turbines and their average lifetime is 20 to 25 years. So every 20, 25 years, you get a big pile of this stuff all over the place where, uh, where they're going to be put if we go forward with the kind of model that uh, that I showed you and that Ann talked about. Um, so what about the accidents? Well, in fact, the accidents show that nuclear is safe. Uh, they're spectacular, but in fact, Three Mile Island didn't hurt anyone. Nobody died and nobody got sick. The amount of radiation release was, was equivalent to background. I'll show you that in a second. Chernobyl, 28 people are known to have died. They were the first responders who got there and didn't, you know, weren't protected from the radiation. Chernobyl, by the way, had no containment ve ve vessel over it. So the, the, and it started burning, the carbon in it started burning and that led to the dispersal of materials. But there is likely that some people, some children got uh, uh, thyroid cancer as a result, but we never, nobody ever builds a reactor like Chernobyl anymore. And finally, Fukushima is very spectacular. Three reactors melted down. Nobody died. Nobody got sick. And further, and the UN goes back every year and looks, and there's no evidence of anybody, of any levels of radiation that would hurt, hurt anyone. Um, so let me say a little about radiation. Um, it's all around us. 84% um, of the radiation that we're exposed to today is, is in the rocks. Um, and in the and coming from outer space, um, the the part that's uh, that's not is we get mo is mostly medical. It, we get our our X rays, our CAT scans, and so on. Uh, that's uh, they're ionizing radiation, um, but they 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 help us. They don't hurt us. And the nuclear part you can see is less than one tenth of a percent of all the radiation we're exposed to. Uh, the toxicologists say it's the dose that creates the problem. You know, the dose today is measured in a term I'd never heard of. I'd heard of millirems from many, many years ago, but millisieverts is what is used now. The, the emergency workers at Chernobyl got 5,000 millisieverts in the, in, and died. Uh, but we all get two to three a year. Uh, if, you're a, uh, if you're an airline pilot flying coast to coast, for a year, you get nine because there's more cosmic radiation hitting you. If you live in Denver, you get more, but there's no evidence that any of the people, any anybody exposed to any radiation at that level affects you. The first 
the lowest dose where people have been able to detect an actual increase in cancer risk is at about 100, which is you can see 40, 40 or 40 factor of 40 or so greater than what you have there. So I have a, I, 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 I try this out. The best, of, this is one of my thoughts, the best unscientific evidence that low level radiation is not harmful is the following. Though millions of particles go through us from the rocks around us, from our buildings, from our food, from the cosmic rays every day, our children and even our grandchildren look like us. Um, and the reason is life developed on earth over the last 4 billion years, surrounded by radioactivity and mechanisms evolved to protect our DNA, that is to heal the, re the, the DNA or to stop it from reproducing if it was damaged. The result is that the dose effect curve looks like this. It, has, it basically has no effect at low doses. Low doses have little or no effect. And whether you live in a high, in, you know, you live on a, in Nepal or you live at sea level, you're exposed to different levels of radiation, but they're all low compared to the levels that will actually harm you. So the, the fear of radiation has been vastly exaggerated and it led to things like the, the really tragic closure of Indian Point, which was a wonderfully operating nuclear power plant. So my conclusions are one, solar and wind are too unreliable and environmentally disruptive to power a modern society. Nuclear power is the only carbon free source we have today that can expand to power this society and is safe and leaves minor amounts of waste which can readily be disposed of. Um, if you want more, a group I work with called Nuclear New York, that, we, that I'm helping to lead and organize, uh, put out an alternative to the climate action plan of the, the plan of the Climate Action Council and it's available at our website, nuclear, nuclearny.org. Um, but also, since I had to do this so fast, um, it occurred to me that some people might like to talk about this more. And so I'm willing to offer, I'm interested in offering a, a three-part, one-hour workshop series on the three parts of my talk. That is, the first part would be to go over in detail the state's plan as put forward by the Climate Action Council. The second would be talk about nuclear energy. And the third, talk about is it safe and uh, can we live with it? So. If anybody who's listening to this is interested in this, send me an email. And if I get a number, I haven't set a minimum number, but uh, if I get enough to make a quorum for a workshop series, I'll be happy to offer it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Len. Um, thank you very much, Len. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, I grew up during the uh three mile three mile island incident right. right and i remember demonstrating out there as i guess it was a teen or a college student <laughs> and of course uh three mile island and uh so um I think Ann Reynolds said one of the things looking forward in the report is going to be considering nuclear power. And here we have some ideas. Um, not, it's not a debate. Uh, we're not, we're not here to, uh, you know, dress anybody down. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm, you know, so a lot of this to me, I, I do rely on experts and both of you are certainly experts. So um, I will take some questions, uh, comments, try to keep them to a minute, a minute and a half, please. And the responders also, if you can try to keep your responses to a minute and a half, you know, we can get more people in. I'm gonna give priority to retiree chapter members. And uh, and then I will open it to guests and our staff person. Okay, uh, William, you've been waiting patiently. William Lasiza. Hi, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, so 
you know, I recently looked into solar energy for my building here in New York, and I found a lot of different problems with even thinking about doing it. One of the problems I found is that I needed to have new insurance, which I couldn't figure out how much that was going to cost in case the panels got damaged. And they seem to have some insurances, but they don't have insurance. So I looked at that as another cost that I would have to bear. The other thing that I'm doing is I'm using uh, energy from a, from a company in upstate that's providing you know, wind power and stuff and to the building. And one of the things that I've noticed in the last year is the rates have gone sky high. Not only uh, do the Con Ed rates go up, the Con Ed delivery charge rates go up, and then also the rate of the solar power with the renewal of the contracts gone up. So I'd like to pose this as to, you know, the people proposing this stuff is as a person with fixed uh, income with limited and all of a sudden all these new uh, costs are going to show up. How are we supposed to be able to deal with them? The cost is just even for people who haven't done this, their power bill has gone up a lot. So what what is being done to address the increase in costs and how much this is gonna affect people, especially in these lower communities. So um, let's see, in a minute and a half, um, I installed solar and I did have to go to my homeowner's insurance and let them know about it. And they adjusted the, the policy for probably some additional costs. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that, that's, uh, that's, I guess I'm agreeing with you on that one. Um, electricity rates have gone up uh, recently for a whole range of reasons. The short term reason is the cost of natural gas, which sets the market clearing price in New York State. When the natural gas prices go up, the cost of um, electricity for everyone goes up um, because of how the market is structured. But you're absolutely right that the climate plan is going to have some costs for ratepayers. Um, some of it's going to be because of additional investments in transmission. Uh, some of it's going to be for uh, renewable energy um, reasons. Um, and also uh, there's, a, there's a lot of requirements to invest in low income communities, which the legislature passed and the state's gonna have to implement. And that's going to have some costs associated with it too, as well. I don't know if that was a minute, Anne, but. <laughs> No, oh, it was be, it below a minute and a half. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering um, what's going to be done to help us. Um, um, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, I, I'm not doing the timing, but I guarantee you that you were under one minute and 30 seconds because Diane Men is doing the timing and she is not shy about yeah. Yeah. letting people know. But anyway, thank you. So let's uh, take more questions. And again, I'm encouraging people, if you have something to ask, please raise your hand rather than doing it in the chat. Um, and the next person I see is Joan Greenbaum. Oh, I'm on. I'm, I'm thank you. Um, Ann Reynolds, that was a fantastic presentation. And Len, I'm just not going to address yours right now. Um, I see absolutely the need for New York State, every state, and the feds to move as quickly as possible. You're, fro you're frozen with, there, Joan. With. Really? Oh, I'm moving my hands too much. I, I don't know what it is, but you're going in and out like an echo chamber. Try again, and then we could always come back to you. Come back to me. Okay, we're going to come back. Okay. Valerie Krishna? Valerie? Okay, we'll come back to Valerie, too. Eileen Moran. Unmute. I'm I'm unmuted. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Valerie. Uh, yes. Just quickly, I didn't hear anything in the master plan about putting the bricks on building. I live in Manhattan. I can see Hudson Yards. It's the size of a town, a city. And the governor and the and the mayor are talking about 10 new skyscrapers around Penn Station. Most of these new buildings are glass and steel that require enormous amounts of energy to heat and cool. And I wonder whether the master plan has even thought about that. 
So briefly, uh, you are correct. The plan does not put any constraints on building. Um, it suggests that if we do build, it has to be um, electrified and energy efficient. Similarly, you know, if we get a dish, if upstate, the upstate sort of example of what you posed would be additional factories or large employers would come, they would use a lot more energy that would increase greenhouse gas emissions, but the plan does not attempt to, to address that. And, and I think that's wise. I mean, that's sort of a separate discussion about how the state wants to grow and not grow. We can't, I don't think, successfully tackle climate change simply by shrinking, we have to find a way to, to do things with renewable energy and with energy efficiency. So um, it doesn't require less building or knocking anything down. When you build, you knock down greenery. Yeah. Okay, it's a, it's a good point. Joan, we can try you again. You gotta unmute, oh, somebody's gotta unmute. I, I got it. Okay. Um, and I am taking I, somebody's uh, still unmuted. <clears throat> so Anne, it was a great presentation and I love it. I'm just worried a bit about speed um, and uh, give an example. CUNY, uh, where we're sitting, right, um, has uh, updated all of its newer buildings this century and retrofitted many so that they are far more energy efficient. They're really, really saving money on this. Um, but they're saving money off the backs and scalps of people who work in the buildings because the computer control um, is not up to snuff. It's really based on saving money and not based on humans being inside and needing more heat or air conditioning. So uh, that's a bit of a problem in running, you know, getting everything done 2030, uh, 2040, is it not? Yeah, well, broadly speaking, renovating all of the buildings in New York is going to be a huge undertaking. <laughs> and um, smart buildings can help. So that if the buildings are more high tech and they're they have time they have better insulation and they have uh, IT controls on the timing of your HVAC system, for example, but um, they should be and there certainly are examples and technological successes of making buildings totally energy efficiency efficient and also comfortable to be in. But it does mean that builders and renovators have to do things differently. Right, they have to install those smart controls so it can be a comfortable building and be all electric. It's, it's, um, it's a challenge. There's, there's great solutions, but it's going to have to be done. I mean, inevitably, it's going to have to be done gradually because we can't do every building in the state all at once, and we don't have the money for that. Um, and we have 28 years to do this. Um, but it, it, there certainly are examples where buildings can be energy efficient and comfortable, and that's what we have to aim for. Sounds like CUNY has to aim for it too. Yes, big job. Okay, thank you. Eileen Moran, and then, uh, am I unmuted? Uh, yep. I, Eileen Moran, and then Nancy Hemis. Um, I, I guess I have a question for Ann and for um, Le, uh, Lynn. For, for Ann, I would say, I mean, I think the goals as outlined are important, but in other words, here we are in New York State where we passed progressive legislation about making this big energy transition, but we have yet to fund it. So it seems to me politically, that's not there. Um, and I think for both uh, agendas, I think What's absent, as Tom pointed out in the chat, is there's no discussion of conservation, which I think we're not going to make any of the goals without conservation. And that would require an enormous uh, amount of public education because we're asking people to change their behaviors. And that does not happen uh, by snapping your fingers. And I guess for Len, I guess, you know, I, I see the, the absolute logic of why nuclear needs to be a piece of, of, of how we meet our clean energy goals. Um, and I, I, and, and I'm, 
I, I recognize his talking about, you know, creating a way of trying to have a organizing principle to get there. But I think politically, I don't see how it, politically, I think the barriers are very, very high. So, you know, for okay. each of you to speak to those. Okay. Um, why don't we start with Len and give Anne a two minutes rest? Okay. One and a half minute rest. Yeah, I mean, there clearly are barriers. New York State uh, is anti-nuclear right now. Um, the Democratic Party in the in the legislature um, uh, doesn't doesn't support it. Uh, there are very strong uh, environmental organizations. Uh, ANS is one of them that um, uh, basically talk about nuclear but don't support it or actively oppose it. Um, and Whereas the rest of the country, they're very different. I, I mean, I point out that in Wyoming, they competed to get the new nuclear plant to replace a coal plant that was shutting down. And uh, the people in the, in the community around Indian Point uh, lost huge amount of tax revenue that they got from that plant and had no problem with the, there were a thousand jobs in that in that plant that uh, got lost as a result of shutting it down. So there is, in fact, up, as I pointed out, up up near uh, Lake Ontario, they are strong supporters of nuclear because it brings benefits as well as cheap power. Um, so we do have a serious political problem. That's what my little group, Nuclear New York, is working on, is trying to uh, change the view of, and that's why I talk about uh, rethinking the dangers that people um, uh, imagine are fr come from nuclear and from radiation, because there's a lot of misinformation that many of us grew up with from the 60s and 70s. And uh, young people are not as uh, uh, frightened of nuclear and they don't know much about it, but they're interested. Uh, we who lived through that period uh, have prejudices that we need to overcome because we our generation or the one behind me has political power and should use it to make sure the, the state survives. New York City, as I point out, will not survive with the plan that this Climate Action Council is proposing. The first time a big storm comes through, the state will go, the New York City will go black. Thank you. Anne? Yeah, so I know we're not supposed to debate, but I just have to respond to some of this. I hope those of you listening uh, realize that Len and I agreed on lots of things, like our, our the fact that solar and wind are intermittent, the fact that we would have to build a lot of wind and solar under this plan, the fact that it's imperative that we keep the lights on are all things that we agree on. There are a couple of things he said that I don't agree on, and the number one one is that nuclear is not included in this plan, because it absolutely is. Right now, all of you on your electric bills are subsidizing the upstate nuclear plants many times more than you're subsidizing renewable energy. That will change once we build more renewable energy, but when New York closed Indian Point, the wisdom of that decision I'll leave aside, and I'll also say that the Alliance for Clean Energy is not anti-nuclear. We're just pro-renewables because we represent renewables developers. At the same time Indian Point was closed, the state set up a program called the ZEX, the Zero Emissions Credit Program, to keep the upstate plants operating uh, because they were uneconomic without that subsidy. And we are continuing to pay that. And the plan assumes that those projects will get relicensed and continued. It doesn't assume any additional nuclear will get built because the price is too high. And as a result of Lens Group's advocacy and others on in November, they did a sensitivity analysis and they said, well, what would happen if the price of nuclear went way down, which is entirely possible because the CHIPS Act, CHIPS and Science Act, and the I, uh, Inflation Reduction Act at the federal level um, dedicated a lot of funding to do nuclear research to see if small reactors can be made more cost effective. So they did a sensitivity analysis and said, if the price of nuclear does come down, then some would be deployed under this plan. Um, so it, it absolutely, do, absolutely does include it. It's just as the expense, which was pointed out by another questioner is really important it's going to be expensive. We have to use the most cost-effective way to get there. And at least based on the analysis the state did, 
a combination of storage renewables um, is, is the more cost effective way to do it. And we remains to be seen about that last percentage, that dispatchable emissions free generation that could be uh, modular nuclear reactors, but it depends on what happens in the next 18 years to become the most cost effective technology to meet that need. Um, I think I'm over my minute and a half, but someone asked another question about public education. Couldn't agree more. Uh, this is a huge transition in society and most people don't know too much about it. So if there was a way that the state could invest in educating the public about climate change action and what New York is planning to do and how people need to help, I think that would be great, but it's it's tough. Yeah, let me just say, I don't think I okay. used my minute and a half. Oh, um, okay, but, okay. Right. All right, I, what do you have, have left then? What do you have yeah. left? No, uh, 30, actually, 30 seconds. Actually, you use more than a minute and a half, but we can give you another minute and a half. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay, me, all I, right. I, there are a lot I, of people I, waiting, but go I, ahead. Yeah, I just want to point out that NYSERDA, in preparing the plan for the Climate Action Council, did not do a cost-benefit analysis. They did not do an optimization. They did not even claim to provide um, the op cost optimized plan. They presented a plan which was solar and wind based because that's basically what they were told by the Cuomo administration. And furthermore, they don't provide us with costs. There's no way to figure out what the plan will cost, what it will do to electric rates and what the electrification especially will cost Except if you go into the data, you discover into some of their spreadsheets, you discover it will cost thirty thousand dollars per household on average to to uh, electrify a private home. So there's a, a very large expenses involved in there that we don't yet know. I'm working on it, and other people are working on it to try to find out what will the plan actually cost. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven hands. I'd like to take everybody um, and see how we do on time. Uh, so if people could be even briefer than a minute and a half. Okay, otherwise somebody, I also have to uh, ask either Ava or Bonnie or, or uh, Diane, so please send Dean Hubbard the link because he's lost it and Sand seemed to get in. And I'm assuming Dean can stay later, you know, beyond three, then we can continue to go. Uh, Nancy Hemmies. Thank you. I'll be I'll be brief. I just wanted to um, raise the issue of conservation that already has been raised, and I'm disappointed that the state plan does not include conservation as one of the components in cost analyses. Or maybe I'm wrong. Perhaps it does, but um, conservation ultimately, I think, is going to be one of the the the, the, the breakers of any plan. People talk now about getting their electric. SUVs, which require two batteries because they're such big, heavy cars. They're, you know, they're electric, but they're not conservative. So I think conservation is 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 huge. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, maybe we could take a second question, and you, uh, the speakers, could address both. Nancy's asking about conservation. Tom and Gotti. Hi, Tom. Unmute Tom, please. Can you press unmute, Tom? Are you able to okay. do that? Okay. okay. All right, sorry about that. Um, okay. Uh, there's just so much. Uh, you know, on one level, uh, I look at the plan and it sounds great because we're finally talking about introducing new energy sources. On the other hand, there's nothing about reducing uh, demand, consumption, the, the need for consumption. And it goes back to, and, and you can't rely, uh, I, it sounds to me like a collection of technological fixes um, that are not gonna solve the problem. Transportation, for one, it's great to have 
a lot of electric vehicles, but we have an interstate and state highway systems that were built to get people around through the use of the least efficient means of transportation. So it's, it, I, it, I can't believe that the state is going to fund expanded mass transit all over, uh, not even in the New York City, uh, in New York City, but uh, talk about the New York region in time to meet the climate goals. Uh, and um, there's a hypocrisy when the governor talks about changing the, the laws so that you can have more dense development. Um, look at New York City, the most dense th new developments at, and, and uh, Hudson Yards is a good example of it, has one of the lowest occupancy rates in the city. The buildings are half empty. So in terms of they may be energy efficient and more energy efficient than the old uh, buildings in the city, but they're not, the heating and, and the air circulation isn't helping people because uh, they're empty half of the year or even all, all year, they're investment products. And, and, and the governor's talking about building more of them in, in Manhattan, in the densest part of Manhattan. And you would think, oh, higher density means more efficiency. Well, not if nobody's living there and not if they're just uh, icons uh, to store excess capital from around the world. That's all I wanna say. Okay, so <laughs> we have two questions about demand, uh, uh, conservation and, and demand. Uh, the speakers wanna address that briefly. Sure. I, I would say if you did a word search on this plan uh, for energy conservation, it probably would come up empty. But that doesn't mean that it's not really a lot of um, attention and focus on energy efficiency for buildings that's referred to as energy efficiency and building electrification. And they did a lot of analysis to show, for example, it's so much smarter and so much more cost effective to re-insulate and redo your building envelope and make it more efficient before you put solar panels on your roof and before you electrify your heat with heat pumps. And so um, the plan does include a lot of building energy efficiency. It's going to be tough to do it. Um, they might not use the words energy conservation, but they do focus on that. On the transportation side, I'd say the analogy for energy efficiency is, as you say, public transit, getting people out of their cars, having uh, housing be transit linked and have people use buses and subways and trains. Um, I can't, you know, say, I think it was Thomas who asked that question. I, the plan has a lot in there about reducing VNT and in investing in transit, but I have to say, I agree with you that it's going to be one of the tougher things to do because it's a lot of money and it's caught up in a lot of history with MTA investments and what the state, how much the state is willing to spend in public transit or the city. Um, so I, I think um, energy conservation for transportation is transit. Um, the plan says that New York should do it. Whether New York does it is gonna be remain to be seen. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Paul Van Linden Toll, and then uh, Dave Cuddlechuck. And uh, Patricia uh, yeah. Kenyon is going to be the last um, on the list. Okay, no, please, no more hands. Um, even though I'd like to have more time, Paul. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and to the, the panelists. Um, yeah, my concern is the first place uh, that there is no um, reference in the CAC for international uh, reference. We know, for instance, that uh, Germany as well um, as well California took economies which have deeply invested in renewables, yet uh, their utility bills are the highest. Uh, California's utility bills much higher than the neighboring uh, neighboring states and Germany has the highest utility bills in um, in Europe. 
The cheaper oh, ones, oh. Uh, the cheaper ones are actually in um, France, which is nuclear. And the problem with renewables is that they might might be cheap, but they uh, they need to be supported by all kinds of uh, gas uh, uh, gas machine gas uh, filled machinery to provide a stable uh, flow of electricity. Uh, so uh, uh, no matter how cheap the renewables are per piece, it always will become more expensive because it is not reliable, not dis dispatch and uh, not dispatchable. And that is where the prices come in because the the gas machinery uh, cannot work efficiently. So in that sense, uh, and there is a certain bias against nuclear, apparently. Uh, I don't see the reason for that, but uh, it looks like, you know, um, renewables are not that cheap as they, as they meant out to be. So I'll see if the people can address that the issue of but how current expenses, the two countries are more, and one state are more expensive is the renewable stuff than uh, the countries which have a more balanced uh, supply of electricity. Okay, I am not sure that I got the question succinctly enough to repeat it, but you're talking about international collaboration, I think. No, I don't, no, I don't no, know. I can, I can respond and if- yeah. yeah, okay. Unless Len wants to. Well, yeah. I don't know. No, go ahead. Well, I guess the, the easiest thing is to agree with you. Um, this transition is going to have some costs associated with it. Um, I think it would be foolish to, to say that it won't. Um, and so that leaves us with two imperatives. We have to do it the most cost effective way we can. Um, and I think over the 28 year period between now and the deadline, if you will, we need to reiterate that cost assessment so that we're continuing to do it the cheapest way. Um, that's one thing. The second thing though, is we also have to make sure that we do it so that there's other benefits for New York. It's a lot, uh, the council talked about that a lot, given that this, there's a cost to this, given that it could increase our electric bills, we have to make sure, for example, that it creates jobs in New York, that it reduces other pollution. So there's health benefits in New York. Um, and the, the plan has a, a lot of attention to that. But I don't wanna be the one to deny that this like complete transition uh, over 28 years in New York State isn't gonna, isn't gonna require some significant investment because it will. Okay. Um, Dave Cuddlechuk. Yeah. Um, uh, I've lent for Len, um, Len, essentially, I, it seems to me you're advocating increased use of nuclear power. Um, and and um, you said, well, it has to be dispatchable. Well, fine. Um, then we don't have a dispatchable nuclear unit functioning in the United States today. The Bill Gates one is in Wyoming that you suggested might be online, what, in 2026 or 2028. Um, and you have to put the time, you have to figure that there, even if you could get it working, there's gotta be a period of time over which you get rid of all the problems with it, the little things that you missed. I mean, re-engineer, re-engineering. We have about 25 years to deal with the climate change transition that is that scientists say will be a disaster for the world. Does the timetable you're talking about for nuclear, is that real and consistent with the climate change deadlines that we face with rising um, global temperatures? We're not moving fast enough. New York State isn't moving at all yet. They haven't recognized what I've what I've said that the that the defer problem is has to be faced and has to be faced now. I think that if we if the, we as a state and as a country took it seriously, we'd have a Manhattan Project two two point and we would be able to produce the, that kind of re dispatchable reactor system like the natrium in half the time that 
that the private sector is doing it and we would get it done by 2040. It, I mean, we, we need, I said it, I mean, the number 20 is a small number. We need the equivalent of 20 Indian points to power this state completely. That is by 2050, because I'm including the, the power that's needed by 2050. We just have to take it seriously and the country can do that sort of thing. We, you know, I hate to use the old cliche, we got a guy to the moon in eight years. We can, we can get New York State nuclearized in 15, if we can put our minds to it. And, some resources, which will pay back, of course. Right. Okay. In the sky. Um, thank you, uh, Glenn Kisak. Yeah, uh, two just two quick questions for Len. Uh, I looked this up recently. There are 450 nuclear plants in 50 countries uh, around the world. Uh, the, you know, France produces 70 percent of its electricity from nuclear. They're all over Western Europe and Eastern Europe. They're, China's building them. So my question for Len is, what is the, the safety record uh, for those uh, plants? And uh, I believe there are 61 power plants here in the US. What's the safety record for them? Yeah. And the second question is, what about toxicity of, uh, of solar? You know, there are uh, chemicals that go into building uh, solar, uh, arsenic, uh, cadmium. What, what's the, uh, the problem with that? If there's a problem, maybe there's not. And, uh, and they last about 20 years. So what's, is there a problem with disposing them? Okay. Well, you're throwing, you're throwing me softballs here. Uh, that was my I, intention. Oh, the, 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 uh, softballs just answer quickly or yeah, yeah. The, read the article. The, 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 the three accidents that happened with, with nuclear plants over the last 40 years are, are the only damage that has been done and they didn't hurt anyone. Um, as I pointed out, nuclear plants are safe. They're, I can exp I'll explain in a workshop why they're inherently safe. Uh, it's built into the physics of them. They'll shut themselves down. Uh, and yes, solar panels are toxic and they can't be recycled. They're too complex to be sorted out. They're, they'll just end up in landfill every 20 years when they need to be re replaced. I'll push back a little bit on that. Um, there's not a strong recycling market for solar panels yet because there's not a big flood of used solar panels because we're just beginning to grow the industry. Um, in New York State, for example, if you install solar in a large solar facility, you have to create a decommissioning plan and you have to post a letter of credit to say that they'll there'll be money there to decommission it when it's done and to properly dispose of it based on what the regulations are at the time the solar plant closes down. So there's safeguards in place, but it would be really nice if we could attract a solar panel recycling facility to New York so that we would be all ready for that waste stream once it gets rolling. Okay, thank you. Marsha and then Marsha Newfield and then John Highland. Hello? Got it, yeah, Marcia. Yeah. Okay. I, I've read some of my organizations have um, said that if we converted to more of a plant-based diet, we would be saving a lot of energy. That's question number one. Question number two is: What does the council have anything to say about nationalizing the electrical industry? Okay. Uh, I think that's for Ann. And any any um, on the second one, no. The um the council did not address issues of national in the industry. On the first one, yes, a plant-based diet does uh, um not just save energy but avoid a lot of climate emissions and largely in the agricultural sector because it does cost a lot of energy to raise crops to then feed animals to then eat. <laughs> so um, research has shown that eating a plant-based diet is better. I will say that the plan doesn't really address that in the sense that it's a private decision, um, but I do believe your statement is for sure true. Okay, John, John Highland. And then oh, Anne. Okay. Okay, John. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I think I may begun to be address what I what I put in the chat, but uh, basically 
it seems to me that there's a, a major problem as to who's going to who's going to lead this. Who's going to do this? Is it going to be a profit uh, operated operation, or is this going to be a, a public good? It seems to me energy is a a, a human right, and uh, it, it 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 feeds it generates the possibilities for everything else. And if it's can if it is set up and run on the basis that private enterprise or capitalism is run now, there'll be uh, no, no matter what technology we use, uh, we're in big trouble. And I wonder if that if that aspect of it is in the discussion, either at the state level or in the, in the nuclear power um, community. Or, um, but that's, that was my point. Well, <clears throat> let me just say that the transition we're talking about is not going to happen without very strong governmental uh, driving. It's not going to the market is not going to respond to climate change. Public policy has to respond, whether it does it through through uh, public private partnerships using private sector uh, entities to actually build the things. Government has to be the force that makes it happen. And we have to face that and celebrate that, that it's a public good to stop climate change. And it's from government's responsibility to see that it happens. Okay, I think, is that okay, Anne, or you want to, okay. Um, Anne Ediger, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name, but it's another Anne with an E, and I, I love it. Three yes. Anne's with E. Ediger, hello. Um, uh, I, I have a question for each of uh, Anne and Len. Um, is, Anne, can you speak to what's being done to encourage um, the, the adding of solar panels, I guess, to existing buildings. Um, there are so many out there that could take them, big, big box stores, large buildings, et cetera, that have huge roof areas that are not being used. Um, can you speak to that? And just sort of as a way of maybe not taking over more uh, land, in a sense, to build solar uh, panels. Um, for Len, um, I, I, I think, you know, the, the whole issue of it, nuclear power hasn't hurt anyone is really disingenuous. Um, it has hurt so many people. Uh, in Fukushima alone, 100,000 people were displaced, not not necessarily by the flood, but by the power, well, by the water that then that got uh, dispersed and, and, and all the the pollution. And, and now, for example, in Fukushima, they're dealing with how to deal with all of the water that now has been drained out of the the plants to keep them uh, the the heat down, and they have no place to dispose of that water. And they're talking about releasing it into the Pacific, which is uh, uh, going to cause huge other effects um, for many other places. And the same with Chernobyl, and the same with Three Mile Island. Nobody can live there for huge in huge areas. So it's not just a matter of how many people died, you know, immediately after. It's it, it's it's a much bigger effect than that and so i wonder if you can address some of those other effects that are just as serious and far reaching as a person who died immediately after the incident well i can't do justice to your question in this framework but i will in a workshop but almost everything you said is based on fear and misinformation um, the people who were evacuated were because they were flooded out some left because they were frightened, partly by American officials who exaggerated what the danger was to the public from the reactors. The evacuation was not required by anything physical, it was required by people who were afraid. Uh, and the water is perfectly safe to put into the ocean. It's diluted, it's tritium, it's completely, completely um, uh, harmless. I mean, it's it's six orders of magnitude below what could cause any effect on any person uh, compared to the general background. There's already tritium in the ocean. There's all kinds of radioactive materials already in the ocean. And to add the little bit of tritium from those plants does nothing at all to increase the risk to anyone, except unfortunately to fishermen whose, whose product is people will worry about because of the misinformation that is disseminated. Okay. Um, you want me to answer the 
rooftop. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Anne. Just, just briefly, so New York has two different programs to encourage solar. For the distributed solar, it's called New York Sun. You can get an incentive to put it on your home or building. Um, for the grid scale, the bigger projects, they compete with each other to get a contract with NYSERDA. Uh, a pet peeve of mine though, is that the New York Sun program, which is working great for residential and actually for community solar, New York now has more operating community solar than any state in the country. But you still did, this is the pet peeve part, you still don't see roof uh, solar on very large um, like warehouses and distribution centers for Amazon, et cetera. And the economics for them are not working and um, it's it's really unfortunate. So, I mean, I think we need a different, a different program for those commercial, large commercial rooftops. Um, but But I will say, just sort of as a nod to what Len was saying about we really need a lot of solar to get to the goals in the law and we're going to need rooftop community solar commercial rooftop solar and grid scale solar farms in order to get there. Okay, thank you, Alfred Friedland and then Patricia Canyon. Yeah, well, I'm certain. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly glad that some people have referred to the imperative for us to curtail our profligate consumption. But Len, uh, some 65 years ago, my high school physics teacher said that in physics, in nature, you get nothing for nothing. So I understand that the production of energy is not going to be without adverse consequence to the environment. But you spoke of cooling nuclear plants by using the water of Lake Ontario, but doesn't that just transfer the heat to the water? And after all, aquatic life, fish, et cetera, can live only within a narrow temperature temperature range, and if you heat the water, that might kill the fish. The fish actually thrive from warmer water. But as I pointed out, the, we have to expand nuclear much beyond what it is now. Well, not that much. I mean, we have four plants, and I said 20 will will deal with the electric needs of this state, and they don't have to be near water. They can be air-cooled. The new smaller reactors is just a matter of surf ratio of surface area to volume. The smaller reactors can be cooled just by air cooling. If you see that picture of the natrium, there's a bunch of fans cooling it. It's not using water at all. Um, I, I want to add one thing. I don't know if I get a last chance, so I'm going to take it here. Um, one thing you can do that hasn't been talked about really is the cost of electrifying. I referred to it earlier in terms of the cost of putting air pump, heat pumps on an individual home. But you can use nuclear power to make synthetic methane and synthetic gasoline and synthetic carbon free carbon neutral aviation fuel so you don't have to electrify everything if you if you take nuclear power seriously you can use it to avoid all the cost of electrification which is billions hundreds of billions of dollars just for new york state much less the rest of the country thank you okay um patricia canyon Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have a couple of questions, one for Ann and one for Len. Um, I have a concern as somebody who's older and a lot of us are in this session. Um, people who are talking about saving energy want to move everybody out of cars and into uh, public transportation. Well, I use my car to get my groceries and other th things, other errands. And I don't feel that I would be physically capable of dashing through subway uh, stations and doing all of that. So I think that, that particular concern or that particular idea would lead to um, significant uh, problem with the quality of life for the elderly. Can't replace all the individual little car trips that somebody like me takes with um, you know the, the, the little shuttles that, that uh, some of the more uh, disabled people use. And that would be for Anne. And the uh, one for Len, the big problem with waste 
from these nuclear power plants is not the immediate amount that's produced. As, as you say, it is uh, small and it is well sequestered in, in these nuclear power plants. However, that stuff is going to be dangerous for 10,000 years. You know where we were 10,000 years ago? We weren't even to the uh, point of Egyptian civilization. Are we going to have the memory and the, the knowledge to avoid this stuff? Hard to tell. The other thing about that is, um, I guess I'll-, I'll, I'll Yeah. Patricia, thank you very much, um, especially raising the issue about the elderly, because lots of us on this uh, call as retirees are elderly, but I think let's get some answers. I see one more person has a hand up and I have to call on her and then we'll close. Uh, okay. Take a shot at that first one. Sure. sure. So I will say that the plan is chock full of both carrots and sticks. So there's a lot of some mandates um, suggested. They're you know they're mandates in the plan, but as I said, the legislature or the agency would still have to put them in place, and a lot of incentives. And what you're talking about, encouraging people to use transit, would a hundred percent always have to be an incentive. And I think really the incentive is you make transit better and more convenient and more frequent and more comfortable. And then people who can take it can take it and, and use their cars less. But there's nothing in the plan, nor should there be, that would tell people they couldn't use their cars or they had to they had to get out of the cars. I mean, the, the fact is that there's a lot of people who, who don't have cars or get to the point where they can't drive and wouldn't it be nice if public transit was more convenient and safe and, and comfortable, but it should never be, and it wouldn't be telling people they couldn't use their cars. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah, the, the method I showed of getting rid of waste, you put them down a one mile uh, long, uh, well, and they'll be there a million years. It'll never bother anybody. Uh, the Earth doesn't change that rapidly. Um, and um, the the thing about the nucle nuclear power is we can do it cheaply. We did in the 60s and 70s, we built 100 reactors. They cost one tenth of what it costs today to build because we've forgotten. We, we don't have the, the workforce anymore to build those kind of construction projects. So people are developing reactor models that are built in factories. And it, the energy can be cheap again, is what I'm saying. It won't be too cheap to meter, but it will che be cheap again and we can be energy rich and you can drive your car uh, either with a carbon neutral fuel or electric car. Because uh, if you take nuclear seriously and do it efficiently, we can be energy rich again. Okay, Nancy, we are running really, really late. If you have a question, please, 30 seconds. I know you're sick and in Mexico, and Nancy's also the head of our envir environmental justice working group, PSC. Nancy. Can't hear. Can't hear you. Don't take off your mask if it's not safe. Oh. Sorry, yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eileen co-chairs with me, just, just a point. Okay, okay. So, but I, I wanna say that th this has been a really useful presentation. You know, it, it really shows us the complexity of the issue, that there are so many different ways that really need to change. And I wanna encourage everybody on the call to be active in that change. You know, and, and one of the things that's wonderful about this whole complex problem is that you can plug in to the things that you care most about. And I, I want to put in a plug for the Environmental Justice Working Group just to say we are working mostly on CUNY and conservation there. And if we were able to do a lot of conservation and um, uh, transform the energy system or at least decrease the carbon output, um, of, of our almost 300 buildings uh, and do some composting, we would have a big impact on New York City. That's
that's okay. uh, we're also there are other things too. Yes. We have representatives going to a lot, and we need right, them. Nancy, going I'm to sorry. A lot of groups. I'm, I'm, and I just want to say one other thing. No, Third, I'm sorry, and, Nancy. Please, because okay. we were. You, the Environmental Justice Working Group has done fabulous work. Eileen is the co-chair. There are many forums. It, you know, you can speak to our chapter again in many ways about it. People can get to you easily. Uh, but we have to stop because Dean is being very gracious and able to stay till 3.30. But we have to get to the second part of our program. I, I really want to thank uh, both speakers. Ann Reynolds is not retired as we are. <laughs> and, you know, she- But I would like to be. <laughs> she'd like to be and you'll love it. And, you know, you can come and talk with us. But she took two hours from her job as a, an executive director to talk with us, to answer the questions uh, very, very, very rich discussion. And Len, of course, uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. Len has been anxious to talk to us about this and we finally have mm -hmm. been able to give him a yeah. forum and he's offering more if you want to talk with him because he will do these workshops. So I, I thank you both very, very much. A super important topic. And I think with that, I'm going to ask, bye, thank you, be well, travel safely. Uh, I'm going to, yes, okay. Um, okay, Thanks. Dean is here, I hope, uh, Dean Hubbard, and he's going to update us. I don't know if there's that much up to update uh, since the last meeting we had on the 23rd, but we need to hear from him and then you may have some questions. So, Dean, are you here? Yes, I am here. Oh, hello, Dean. Hey, Thank everybody. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, no, not at all. It's a fascinating conversation. And I don't know how many folks know, actually, my one of my previous lives, I ran the labor program for the Sierra Club. So I am deeply interested in that conversation. Uh, although in my job here, don't have much official to say about it, but appreciated being able to listen in. Um, so yeah, there really is not very much new to report since um, our conversation on January 23rd, just uh, to recap, um, due uh, in large part to the overwhelming um, opposition uh, expressed by uh, retirees and their allies from across the city, including many, many PSC members. Um, we have been able to stop the city council from pursuing this amendment to the New York City Administrative Code that Mayor Adams wanted in order to be able to uh, force uh, retirees into Medicare Advantage. Um, that change would have removed the floor under the city's contribution to health care coverage uh, for both retirees and in-service uh, uh, workers and their families. Um, so uh, that is dead. That is not going anywhere. Um, we have been, as most folks remember from the last meeting, the PSC has been actively pursuing and promoting uh, an alternative proposal that would um, be premised on not uh, forcing retirees into any care, kind of Medicare Advantage program, allowing people to keep their senior care premium free if that's what they want, um, funding the stabilization, so-called stabilization fund, which is a large collectively bargained fund that uh, is very complex and pays for a lot of different things, including um, uh, uh, our welfare fund, um, it, which is in serious financial trouble. Um, our proposal is that we have found that there are sufficient funds in reserve 
uh, and what's called the Retiree Health Benefits Trust um, to pay retiree health benefits without um, transferring all the money that the city has budgeted to transfer into that fund and instead um, allocating about half a billion dollars a year for the next three years into the stabilization fund, which would prevent the stabilization fund from collapsing. Um, and that would basically buy time for a stakeholder commission that would include retirees, it would include elected officials, it would include unions, it would include healthcare policy experts um, to come up with a concrete plan to essentially restructure the way healthcare is delivered um, to retirees and to active workers in New York City, which right now is a, uh, a Rube Goldberg contraption would sort of be an understatement uh, to describe it. Um, and we have advocated that um, you know, although this stakeholder commission should focus on the whole system of healthcare delivery for active and retired workers, uh, a huge focus of it needs to be hospitalization costs, which are skyrocketing and out of control. Um, and uh, that's essentially the plan that we have been advocating. Um, and uh, the there's a great deal of interest um, by uh, uh, members of the Progressive Caucus of the Council, um, especially Carmen De La Rosa, who was chair of, is chair of the uh, Labor and Civil Service Committee, which held those hearings on the administrative code change um, uh, in our plan. Um, and uh, we have put together a letter for council members to sign on to uh, basically supporting our plan. Um, and, uh, we are encouraging folks to reach out to their council people um, and uh, urge them to sign up to that letter and to support our plan. Um, and so that's uh, you know, a very quick sort of summary of where we're at. Um, there was a very good article uh, in the chief uh, that uh, came out on January 31st, um, which uh, talks quite a bit about how our proposal and it quotes extensively from James Davis. Um, it's worth taking a look at. Um, and uh, as uh, Bonnie posted in the chat, the, uh, the page on the PSC website, what's happening to retiree healthcare is very good. And it's frequently updated with the latest information. Um, so that's uh, kind of my update. Um, and happy to answer questions folks have, although if it's questions about um, your healthcare and how it gets delivered, those are best addressed to the welfare fund. I am not an expert in the details of how um, individuals' um, healthcare benefits get delivered. Um, okay. So with that said. And, um, and Debbie Bell is not here. She's on a much needed and earns vacation, yeah. uh, even though she's retired. She's yeah, retired. right. <laughs> but thank you, Dean. So yeah. um, if you have a question, uh, please raise your yellow hand. I see Erwin Yellowitz. Yeah, thank you, Dean. Uh, there, uh, it's been reported in the press, uh, both that what you reported, that the PSC plan has uh, been widely discussed and uh, my first question is, uh, has the City Council Progressive Caucus, which had expressed an interest in this plan and might uh, and represents a majority of the City Council, have they adopted the plan? Have they let the mayor know that they favor it? And the second question, which is related to that, is a report that was in the press this week that the mayor is still intent on going ahead with the Medicare Advantage plan despite the fact that there would be no option available. In other words, that Medicare Advantage would be the only option available and that he is pursuing that uh, through a contract with Aetna. So I wonder if you could comment on where we stand with those two developments. Yeah, and thank you for the excellent question, Erwin. Um, so uh, the 
The Progressive Caucus has not yet as a caucus formally endorsed our plan. I think the getting uh, a critical mass of council people um, uh, on board um, is uh, the first step to that. Um, and uh, the thinking is that at that point we can, um, with the, the, the council in our court, we can then turn our attention to the mayor. Um, yes, I think it's correct to say the mayor is intent on moving forward with Medicare Advantage. Um, as we've talked about here before, there are serious legal questions about his ability based on a recommendation from uh, an arbitrator to unilaterally remove senior care as an option for people. Um, the retirees have promised to sue if he does that. Um, and, you know, it's just a personal opinion and one can never uh, predict with any kind of certainty the outcome of any legal proceeding, but I think the retirees uh, have a strong basis um, for that claim. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's certainly correct to, to say that he has publicly expressed uh, an intention to move forward with a Medicare Advantage um, notwithstanding the position he took uh, as a candidate um, opposing forcing retirees into Medicare Advantage. Um, so it'll be a lot of fun to um, bring his attention to his about face um, uh, at the moment that we uh, shift the campaign to focus on targeting the mayor. Um, okay. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Dean. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Faina Riftina. Uh, this is Faina Riftina's husband, Paul Ross. I'm oh, okay. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm sitting in for her. That's okay. So uh, this is an issue that I think impacts a lot of us. We are still getting $15 copay bills. Uh, we we get our medical care at Mount Sinai and I've got a stack of them on, on the desk here and I don't really know what to do about them. Some of them are getting close to collection. Mm -hmm. I ever see the money back uh, or should I do, I don't know what, what the option is and I'd love to have some advice on that. Yeah, and here we're sort of straying into the ground where my little bit of knowledge becomes uh, slightly dangerous. Um, but they, there was a decision um, that you were referring to, um, which as far as I know has not been appealed, um, which uh, barred uh, mm -hmm. the co-pays that the city had imposed for uh, uh, people on senior care. Um, and uh, our understanding is um, that, uh, yeah, any co-pay that, uh, is being charged uh, after the date of the decision, which I think was January 11th, um, uh, is incorrect. Um, and that um, the uh, insurer had uh, promised that if people reach out to them, they will make sure to have those removed. Um, there is um, uh, an email uh, from Debbie Bell on this subject, which I'll try to multitask and look for it while uh, we're getting the next question. Uh, and then I'll put it into the chat that gives a little, little more detail about what yeah. folks should do. I, I mean, I'm looking at our last blast. Um, and uh, I, I remember Debbie saying that from January 12th, 2023 going forward, you shouldn't be getting these bills. If you are getting these bills, um, you can perhaps go to uh, the cop, uh, the OLR page, Office of Labor Relations. I maybe somebody can put the um, uh, link in the chat. Print that out and bring that with you. Aside from I that, put that in the chat. I think mm -hmm. uh, I'm writing that down as a question. 
uh, for us to ask, um, we can ask Donna Acasa, we can get back to you more specifically on exactly what to do. I, I can't tell you not to pay them, but I could tell you not to pay them. I mean, you know, I wouldn't pay them, but that is my personal, you save the receipts, you have the documentation, uh, mm. but people should do what they're comfortable with. I, I wouldn't, I would wonder if one pays, if one would get that money back. Uh, I, I, I mm. don't know. So, but we'll get more information and what just happened here. Oh, what is this? Somebody put something on the screen. Who put this on the screen? John Bin, who is John Bin? John Bin? Uh, okay, I don't know what this is. Um, can we get this off the screen? Are people seeing something on the screen? Supplement <clears throat> table? Yes. Yeah, what is it? Who is it? John Bin used to work at LaGuardia, natural in the science department. Okay, well, uh, First of all, I wish people would not put things on the screen without telling me or preparing us. And I, I don't know what that was. So I think, I think that was just an accident. Okay, great. If an accident is everybody makes mistakes. So no problem. Um, Irving Markowitz. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I am very confused about our relationship <clears throat> to the Municipal Labor Council. Um, I, uh, there has been only the briefest mention of what happened with the Municipal Labor Council, but it seems to me that if the Municipal Labor Council is going to support this change to medical advantage, it is definitely going to be in the interest of the mayor to ignore anything that we might have to say. So I was curious as to whether or not um, we had reached out and what we were doing with the Municipal Labor Council, particularly the UFP and DC 37, uh, to have them explain their position and to change their minds. Uh, getting into the specifics of why they are continuing to support the mayor's plan, I think should be very interesting. And if it's something that we really dip, deeply disagree with, we should make that disagreement manifest. We should make it clear that that is not in our interest and that we should do something about it. Okay, that's uh, it. Yeah, thanks, Irving. Um, we actually had a, an extensive and I think a good conversation at the meeting on the 23rd about the, the role of the MLC and where the PSC sits uh, within that power dynamic. Um, just to reiterate a little bit of that, um, the Municipal Labor Committee is um, basically every union that um, engages in collective bargaining with the city of New York, uh, or as in our case, um, you know, the, the entity that we work for, which is CUNY, gets substantial funding from the city of New York. Uh, it's about 150 different unions. Uh, the two by far the largest, uh, you mentioned our DC 37 and the UFT, which although we're pretty good size at 30,000 active and retired members, they dwarf us. Um, in comparison. Um, so uh, the we have and continue to express um, our point of view within the MLC and publicly um, and the fact that we differ um, from the beliefs of uh, majority of the MLC unions. Um, we are also actively talking to other unions that have either expressed opposition or have expressed some questions or doubts um, uh, 
uh, and actively encouraging them to look at and support our proposal. Um, it's um, the MLC. Um, yeah, represents, uh, you know, between active and retired members and their families, we're talking about a million and a quarter covered lives. So there is potentially uh, a lot of power for good um, within that coalition. Um, the problem is that right now, um, the, the position they've taken, particularly on Medicare Advantage, is one that is, in our view, uh, harmful um, to retirees and ultimately to, to active members. Um, so it's important to change that um, to change that dynamic, and we're working very hard to do it. Um, we have to do it in a way uh, that demonstrates that we are dealing with um, uh, union uh, brethren, um, people who are part of the labor movement who we uh, not only express solidarity with, but we need solidarity from uh, in our contract negotiations. Um, so we've tried to do this in a very principled uh, way um, and an effective way. And uh, I think so far that we have. Well, hey, it's my understanding that uh, the UFT and DC 37 in particular think that there's going to be a $600 million savings by going with medical advantage. Yes. That's the figure that's come up repeatedly in the past. And yes. I once asked for an explanation of where they got that figure from. I oh. never got a satisfactory answer to that question. But the assumption seems to be that that $600 million is going to go for a new union contract for higher wages. Okay, uh, uh, Irving, I'm sorry. Work. That okay. is crazy. Okay, I, I'm sorry to. The assumption, and we have not been able to talk about this so far in this group. Well, and I think it's a failure of our association. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I can uh, talk about that. Um, so the $6 million, $600 million figure came from what they projected, um, uh, they being the city, projected they would uh, save um, in costs um, by moving to Medicare Advantage last year. Uh, so that would have been uh, for the entire year of 2022. Um, and it's a combination of um, uh, savings to the insurance company by things like having prior authorizations um, and um, payments uh, to the insurance company that are made by the federal government for essentially taking over the administration um, uh, of Medicare. Um, so that um, is a separate issue from the other issue you raised, which is um, folks have expressed some concern about uh, one of the uses of some of these funds from the Labor Stabilization Fund um, many years ago was uh, in part to help pay for raises for the teacher contract. Um, that's a separate issue. Um, uh, and yeah, that's about as much as I know or can say about that. And of course, the PSC plan starts with an alternative proposal of how to fill that hole um, in the stabilization fund. And right. I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, you know, it's on the website, we send it to you, and we've, we've talked about that. But yeah, yeah, and the whole is bigger, to put it out there, than the 600 million, because there's all, um, that's just what they projected they would save in one year for Medicare Advantage. Uh, the, I think that the, um, the deficit, the stabilization fund is over a billion at this point. Um, so. And it's gonna get bigger. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that's, ridiculous. see if I can try to explain it. Debbie knows this stuff much better than me, but I've learned a lot from her. Um, the, there's many reasons for that. The, the biggest driver of that is what's called equalization. Um, and that is this formula that was agreed to uh, way many years ago now um, when um, there was sort of a uh, back and forth every year in terms of which was more expensive, GHI or um, HIP. Um, and so the deal was um, that uh, when GHI was more expensive, um, uh, money would be paid out of the fund. When HIP was more expensive, money would be paid into the fund. Um, but the problem is um, because the HIP premium has been uh, capped, essentially it's artificially capped, every year for the last several years, the GHI premium has continued to go up. HIP has stayed where it was. So more and more money is being paid out of the fund. So that's one of the things that sort of about the way the fund is structured and runs that needs to be addressed. Uh, but we need some time for everybody to figure out and agree, how do we address that? How do we fix it? Um, and so that's the purpose of us saying that in the meantime, we need to redirect funds into the stabilization fund so it doesn't collapse while we figure out how to address some of these structural problems like the equalization payments. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Dean. And thank you, Irving, for asking the questions. It's a, there's a lot of stuff to wrap our heads around here. There's also information that's, there's a lot of information out there. It's not all put out there by us. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it can be confusing. We're trying to keep you informed uh as best we can of the facts and provide the resources to you to find out and ask your questions uh we could also put of course in the chat the welfare fund address because specific questions like copays and things like that you could direct to the welfare fund um Okay, well, it's it's been uh, a great meeting. I really appreciate- Bill Friedheim has a question. Why don't I see that? Oh, okay, Bill Friedheim, sorry, Bill. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just wanna make an additional response to Irving. There is tons and tons of information uh, on our website and Bonnie has provided a link in, in the chat. Um, the PSC has made very clear its position uh, in opposition to the majority of the MLC and in opposition to the uh, proposals put forward by the UFT and DC 37. And all that information is on the website. Uh, if you go to that website and you click on history or timeline, there are links to all sorts of documents including uh, uh, a link to a letter from James Davis after the July 2021 vote of the MLC pushing for the move of retiree health care from traditional Medicare to Medicare Advantage. There's a letter from James Davis after the September vote uh, this past year, 2022, where the MLC voted and with a PSC once again in opposition uh, to support this push for a change in the administrative code. There's a letter that James sent a couple of days afterward outlining the PSC position. Uh, tons of documents, tons of information there. Uh, as I say, if you go to that website and you click on either timeline or history, you'll find maybe more information that you want to add than you want to actually pour over. Okay. So, uh, and yeah. if you have further questions, um, I'm sure that if you email Dean, you know, if you email Ann, uh, we'll respond to them. But it's not as though that the PSC has not made its position vis-a-vis -vis, yes. uh, the, 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 the MLC uh, available. Okay, thank you. And Bill knows because he puts all that information up there as the webmaster and as our 
webmaster for the retiree page. Um, okay, I see another hand, and that is Susan Newman. And this will be uh, yes, I, question because D uh, Dean has to leave at 3.30. Okay. This is just a quick question about uh, what happens if the mayor goes ahead with this. Um, I don't quite understand how he got control of my Medicare. That comes directly to me. So if all fails and I want to bail out individually, I, I assume that I have the right to do that. He can't, he can't just shove me into that. That's the question. Yeah, that's a good question. And um, the concern that we have um, is that the way that the city interprets the administrative code, you have to be in um, city provided coverage um, in order to be eligible for things like uh, IRMA and Medicare Part B reimbursement. Um, so there is a potential that, um, you know, if, if you sort of just go on your own for Medicare, which as you say, you have a right to do, um, it, uh, the, the city may, may take the position that you're not eligible for the additional city uh, provided benefits uh, that retirees have, like uh, IRMA and Medicare Part B reimbursement. Yeah, I hope but, we don't go there. That's all. Okay, thankfully, yes. Yeah, so hopefully, we will not go there. In the meantime, yeah. we're coming up on March, and that will be—I don't know the exact date. Bill might know it, but we're coming up on a two-year anniversary of our struggle to keep our traditional Medicare and our senior care premium free. And uh, so far, not just us, but with other groups. Um, somebody asked me to recognize the New York Organization of Public Service Retirees. They are the ones that have brought the lawsuits. And if when Dean mentioned lawsuit, he didn't mean a PSC lawsuit. That's right. He meant uh, the Organization of Public Service Retirees. And so there are many uh, groups playing their part in this fight. Uh, even in the unions, like UFT, if you were at the hearing on January 9th, there were many, many teachers and retired teachers, you know, speaking against uh, what their uh, leaders are, are voting for in the MLC, same in DC 37. Um, those you know, those people have to work and are working within their own unions. And um, there are many organizations that are, uh, are, are working on this with us. But the PSC, I think, has been exemplary on this. And the plan, the positive plan that's put, in, put forward is very important because as James said last week, and we, you know, we can't, we can't just keep saying no, we have to present alternatives. So we'll keep you posted as to specifically what, um, what you can do uh, going forward. Now, uh, I have to make a couple of announcements. Dean, I, I wanna thank you very much. Uh, Thanks everyone. Squeezing us in, thank you so much. He's got a meeting at 3.30. And um, so what's coming up? Well, the rally on February 27th uh, to support our in-service colleagues in uh, their um, push to uh, bring management to the table uh, and, 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 and get a good contract. Uh, so uh, we hope that some of you can be there. I know it's not easy for us to get out um, as senior citizens, but I know some of you will and some of you do. So we'll be keeping you posted about that. The next chapter meeting is a March 6, uh, same time. The topic is contingent faculty changes in US higher education. We have three speakers. Uh, Glenn Colby is the senior research officer of AAUP and has, has done some national studies on contingency. Uh, Barbara Bowen is on the 
program because Barbara spent uh, uh, five terms or 21 years. You know, when Barbara came into to office in 2000, uh, the situation with adjunct labor was very different. Um, and in, in many ways, and the way the union addressed those issues has also evolved and evolved and evolved. So Barbara's going to talk to us about that history. And then the new uh, PSE vice president for part-time personnel, Lynn Turner, will join us. And, you know, she will be talking more specifically about what's going on today. Um, I don't know how many of us were full-time workers at PSC, whether faculty, CLTs, HEOs. My guess is that many of us were. And um, that opportunity very, and very important thing <clears throat> for the university going forward is to maintain a full-time faculty and professional staff. And so I think the this issue of the condition with adjuncts, you know, is very, very, should be very, very important to us. And um, I hope you'll all join us. Uh, what else do I have to say? Um, I want to thank Ama uh, not Amanda, Ava Farkas. I don't know if she's still on. You know, she hosted the Zoom. I want to thank Bonnie, our secretary, Diane Mena, our vice chair, everyone on our executive committee. But most importantly, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming out and you know, asking the right questions and saying the right things and writing the letters and making the calls and getting out on the street if you can do it and coming to these meetings. And I, you know, I really wish we could meet in person. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen, uh, but um, it, it's great to see you all on Zoom at least once a month. And I guess with that, I don't think I forgot anything, but if I did, somebody will remind me. Thank you so much for coming to the meeting. And I think it was a very uh, a good conversation and we'll have more of those together. So thank you and go forward and lobby and demonstrate. Thank okay, you, thank you everybody. Thank you. And oh, thank you, Len, and thank you to Ann Reynolds. Anybody want to come to my workshop, send me an email. Okay. L. Rodberg at Gmail. Okay, thank you, Len. Okay. Um, all right, so I am now the host because Ava had to leave and I have to stop the recording. And do I have to end the meeting? I guess I have to end the meeting. So I'm ending the meeting. <laughs>